PangoCon 2015 uh, independent hardware software. Which is a major electronics distributor. Um, they bought 10,000 boards, um, essentially sight unseen, um, to sell them. Having the TI name around that, even though we refused to brand it as TI, made a huge difference. Um, obviously, them choosing to, to do that. I don't know if they would have done that for any real independent um, hardware software developer. Um, and then, um, but it but it did make it where we were less dependent on TI. Um, because it wasn't a TI product, it was all stuff that was available through the, the catalog. That was enough to essentially bootstrap us. We got decent pricing on the TI parts, and that got us to essentially 120 or so dollars to do manufacturing. That was what was the cost to, uh, to manufacture, with the manufacturer getting cut and everybody else's profit, and then you know, being sold for $149. Um, the board, right? Now, the, the, this is the original Beagle board in 2008. Um, this is now, um, this is now we're building in lots of 100,000. Um, we have multiple hardware manufacturers, and uh, this costs about fifty dollars. And, and to, to, are, we, are we recording now, right now? Yes. Uh, I, I won't say exactly how much it costs to make. <laughs> <laughs> um, but you know, they, they, you can buy those for, for about, about fifty dollars. Um, and you know, so that's essentially bootstrap. So we haven't had to ask TI for any additional money in, in doing that. Um, but we have gotten um, some marketing support from TI, and I continue to get my salary uh, paid for by TI. But now I don't have to do it as a part time thing. It's now I can just message this. And it's, TI likes it because it teaches people how to use um, a TI processors. What's TI? Uh, TI is Texas Instruments. The, uh, um, it's a, a semiconductor company, um, primarily known for, for making analog components, um, and historically also uh, digital signal processors, um, maybe calculators is where most people have, have heard of us. Speak and spell. Um, speak and spell, yay! Um, yeah, so the speak and spell is, is, is freaking awesome. And, uh, <laughs> uh, the, yeah, phone hall. Um, the, oh, uh, ET. ET, yes. Oh, the speak and spell used in the, that's how ET phone hall it was, the, the speak and spell. Um, and one of the one of the creators for the, the speak and spell is actually a mentor of mine, uh, Gene France, was a, a mentor of mine in my career at TI. Um, he's the one that brought me into the applications engineering team. So, um, so I have a lot of connection and, and love for, for speak and spell. Um, that's, a, that's an awesome one. Um, we also make uh, the digital light projector chips, right? If you've seen oh, those, yeah. the DLP chips. Um, and we also make processors. Um, so, uh, for, for used to be a lot of mobile phones, but now it's used a lot more like industrial control chips, uh, like automotive entertainment, uh, point of sale, navigation, basically processors in everything in the world, you know, from your thermostat to your, you know, you're probably carrying. Um, three or four TI processors, you know, the combination of bag, car, you know, actually, I guess you should probably tend to your car, so I'll forget that. You've got more. Um, I, I, I want to talk more about how to really do things independently. Right. So, um, let me introduce myself as well, because uh, I think it's, uh, it's an interesting topic, because independent could mean lots of different things. Um, I want to let you know what it means to me, and sorry if my, I'm still kind of losing my voice. It's been weekend. Um, so I run Indie, IND.ie, which is uh, a social enterprise based in Brighton. We are entirely independent. Um, one of the core design decisions that we made uh, while signing the organization was to, um, to not have any share capital. So we are a specific type of organization in the United Kingdom um, that's, uh, that's incorporated by guarantee. <clears throat> not equity, not shares. So that was a very important decision for us in terms of our independence because it means that, let's say, we're, we're building a distributed social network of some sort right now. Um, let's say in two years' time when Facebook or Google come and say, here's a billion dollars, we're going to buy you, um, all we can say is, sorry, there's nothing to sell, we have no shares. Um, if you actually believe in what we're doing, uh, feel free to invest in a share of our revenue so that we can grow sustainably together. 
um, if, if you actually believe in what we're doing, <coughs> instead of uh, if you just want to buy us and, and, and you know, uh, make whatever we're doing not independent anymore. So uh, we have a manifesto at indie forward slash manifesto that actually lays out all of our principles in detail. But independence is the core of it. And, and that's a core, I'm, I'm a designer. Um, I mean, I, I've been making things with computers since I was seven. Uh, so it's always something I've done. I've always been programming, making games, whatever. But increasingly I realized that you know, the things that we make have a profound effect on the people that use them. Um, we increasingly live in a world where our perception of reality is both, both uh, filtered and, uh, and uh, by, by technology and be affected through technology. So the nature of that technology is very important. Um, if that technology is entirely centralized and owned by a number of monopolies, then we're talking about living feudalism. If it's distributed, if individuals, we, own and control our own technology, then we're living in a democracy. So that's what independent technology means to me. That's the movement um, that we're, we're spearheading with Indy. And as part of that, we're not just talking about it, I'm raising awareness I think is very important, um, but we're also building alternatives. So the first one's called Heartbeat, and it's a distributed social network, but we're not, we didn't set out to build a distributed social network. That's the for us. And they were solving a problem that nobody has. Nobody wakes up in the morning and says, gosh, I wish I had a distributed social network to use. Um, but everyone wakes up and says, hey, here's a, here's a photo I want to share with my friends. That's the problem we're trying to solve with a distributed manner. But through a beautiful, beautiful, seamless user experience. That's, that's just, just, just beautifully convenient and, and, and delightful. If we fail at that, none of the rest of it matters. That it's free and open, that it's distributed, blah, blah, blah. We fail at this convenience and the experience, nothing matters. So I see independent technology as the next iteration of free and open source software, where we bring design thinking into it and we make the products that we make be design led and experience driven so that we can actually compete with silos. <laughs> it's open source, free and open source. <clears throat> so, uh, I mean, and, and that's another thing the, the definition of open is a, is a very important one. It might seem pedantic. Um, and I know Richard, uh, you know, goes on about it all the time. He's the one who actually kind of uh, influenced me in my thinking because I, I I only got into this stuff through open source initially. You mean and, Richard's software? Yes, yeah, yeah. free because he's free free software, not just open. Yeah, well, I mean, if you look at the, do you all know the history of how open came about in reaction to free? Would you like it like a one minute? Sure. Yeah. Um, basically, Richard Stallman, 30 years ago, says, look. Um, I want to create a uh, software that I can protect the freedom of going forward, right? That no one else can close it uh, afterwards. So he creates a software foundation, the, G the GPL license, um, and all is good for a while, but businesses aren't touching it because it has all its ethics and morality attached, right? The source is open as well, but that's just one aspect of it, maybe even a symptom of it, right? Um, and then 10 years later, people like uh, Tim O'Reilly come on the scene who are business people. Um, some of them libertarians, etc. And they go, you know what? The source being open, that's great. That's got productivity enhancements, right? We could really make use of that. But we don't really like the ethics and morality stuff. That's why businesses won't touch it. So why don't we just cleanly separate those and say open source is about the source being open. So I released something under MIT. Anyone can use it, right? Um, you all can use it, but Microsoft can come and take it and then they can invest 10 million into it, and whatever they've added to it with that 10 million, they don't have to share that. So I, I think a better definition of what we mean when we say open is maybe the commons, right? If something's in the commons, then it is, it's, it's protected in the commons. And, and if you use it, then what you put back should be in the commons, because we're, we're trying to create a healthy commons as we're going forward. Um, so yeah. Given that we're such a small group, should we also maybe try and uh, you know, find out who you guys are and what your interests are in independent technology and kind of see what kind of a conversation we can have? Because we're small enough to have a conversation. I would really like to know. I just have a question. The, what you're working on right now, are you, are you saying that was MIT or are you? No, okay. we're going to be releasing it probably under AGPL. Okay. 
um, to protect its freedoms as much sure. as we can. Sorry. Sorry. AGPO. No, no, no. no. What's what's your product called? Heartbeat. Heartbeat. Yeah. is the, uh, is the organization. organization. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I mean, the AGPO product AGPO. might. It's 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 not a distributed social network. It is. It is a, it is a distributed social network. But it's focused on the, the problems, specific problems in the distributed social network space, rather than. Yeah, so I mean, our, our approach is, is quite different to traditional free and open source. So the first platform that's being supported is Mac OS X. And then you say this in a free and open source community, and the first thing is like, yo, Google, what the fuck are you doing? Um, that's where our audience is, regular people who use computers, right? And we want to wean them off of, of a, a closed platform onto one that, that you know, can be ported to other platforms because it's free and open. But we need to be able to reach that audience. So it's a beautiful Mac app initially. It'll be on iOS as well. And it's free and open source, so anyone can port it to anywhere else, and I hope you do. Um, but that's, that's basically just the, uh, the prototype. You know, That's the proof of concept to say, look, this can work. We can have design led free and open source. Stuff that people love to use that also protects their human rights. And, and why Inferno GPL rather than just GPL? Um, because there are aspects of it, um, so there's there's a human directory bit of it, which is the only centralized bit. Um, so Facebook is convenient because you can go to Facebook and you can find all your friends there, right? So you can go to Indy and you can find all your friends there, and you say, "Hey, I want to be friends with you, Scott." And you say, "Sure, yeah, let's do it." And what happens then is all of your devices connect to one another. So Indy just acts as an introducer, but it's a convenient place. For you go to meet, kind of like a pub, right? But other people, can other people duplicate that yes. service portion? Okay. Yes, so that is also free and open source, and hence the HEPL. Um, well, it probably some people don't know the significance of the HEPL, like, um, if you want to maybe go into that. I'm just how many of you know the difference between GPL and MIT? We just kind of quickly covered it, but did, okay, did not that everyone. One. Yeah, so, I mean, that's from a, a you know, a social viewpoint, I mean, it's a pretty significant yeah. um, di dividing line, right? And it, um, you described it, but I'll try to restate it in, in a slightly different way. GPL says that this is source code for, for something. If you, if you do something with that, and then somebody else gets this object that's running the code, um, you can't just, uh, you, you're required to share that, that code back again. So you can't just modify it without giving the, 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 your modifications back. Essentially, if you redistribute it, you can do something privately, whatever. But as soon as you share it to somebody else, you can't just give them what you built. You have to give them a source so they can modify it and, and, and change it themselves. And that's the protecting the freedom of it, so that it can't be closed off later. And, and MIT just says, well, here's the source. Do with it what you want, pretty much. Hey, there's, there's a little bit yeah, beyond that. But, but, but mostly, it's saying that um, I'll, I'll, I'll be nice and tell you, but I'm not requiring you to, 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 to have that same restriction uh, on, your, on yourself. You can, you can choose to close it in the future. So in the definition of distributed, so if you give it to your buddy who's in the same organization, or you're in a big organization and you're sharing it from one department to another, is that distributing it? A distributed topology is one where there are no centers. So where every node is equal. It's different to decentralized, so the web is decentralized. Client-server is decentralized, because there is a server, and there are many clients that connect to a server, so the server is the center. And if there are economies of scale, for those centers to scale vertically, they will. And they'll coalesce as well. So that's how we ended up with the monopolies that we have with Google, Facebook, etc. Because we, you know, we always hear about how Tim Berners-Lee initially you know, had this vision for a beautiful decentralized network. A decentralized network is just the past state of a centralized network if there are economies of scale for those centers to scale vertically. A distributed topology is, is entirely different. There are no centers. And because there are no centers, it scales horizontally. Um, so there, you, you, can, you can have, um, <clears throat> there are analogies in, in, in society as well, in our structures and some of our structures. Take factory farming, for example. Factory farming scales vertically. Right? at the expense of the welfare of the animals, etc. Organic farming scales horizontally. So it's, it's, in a, it's not a, 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 an exact analogy, but it's one way of thinking about the difference. 
when it comes to your, your your data, though, right, the information that you're sharing with, with somebody like a, with Google or Facebook, um, a, a, dis, a um, distributed application will essentially um, share the, that data only directly with the other party that's consuming it. So you make the decision that, you know, I, Jason, give Drew this information, and our applications essentially talk to each other yep. um, directly and provide that information, whereas um, a centralized service, um, you know, I'm trying to use a centralized, but a non-distributed service, um, with, like, just puts it in the cloud, and then, you know, the, the, the people who run those computers in the cloud decide they want to give that information to Drew, or they can give that information to whoever else, um, you've given them rights, or they, um, you know, uh, are, are so inclined to um, provide that information to them. And it's not just a, uh, <clears throat> an academic distinction. This, this distinction and the, and the fact that we have a centralized system right now of clouds um, is the reason we're living in a surveillance society. Because the cost of taking part is for those centers to know everything that you're doing. And it's, there, you know, it, there's no reason that technology has to be designed that way. Uh, there's no technical reason it has to be that way. There's every business reason based on their business model. Okay, so I, um, that was a brilliant description of something, but I don't know if that answered what I was trying to get to. The GPL yeah. license, if you share it with your, you know, co-worker at your work environment, is that distributing it? Oh, that's what you're uh, asking. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right, well, we got, we got a rundown of distributed yeah. versus, you know, decentralized and centralized apologies. But that was a great no, answer to something else. Would, no, no. Uh, it, 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 yeah, it could, it could be that you have not... Um, you can see that it's not providing it outside the company, so there wouldn't be an obligation to provide that, that source back. But that's essentially, um, I mean, it goes it against the intent of it. It depends if you say that I'm providing it as a person or as I'm providing it within the corporate entity. It, it, it sort of if matters. If you were then allowing access to it from the outside, then I guess the AGPL would kick in then. Right. But if you're just using it within your own organization, um, I don't think there's a provision that separates like personal use from uh, a corporate it's so use. It's the, the, the entity or individual that you're distributing it to, you have to provide the source yes. to, right? Yeah. So, but there is if you're, within like, corporate if you're only selling it to your customers, yeah. you only have to distribute it to your yeah. source to your customers. Yeah. Or like the other person in your company, I guess, you yeah. should be able to provide them the source, right? Yeah. 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 In which case, you're technically in compliance, I guess. But, but could you set up rules within your corporation such that other people in the corporation aren't sharing a source? No, I think there's a point of demarcation with the corporation, right? But like, and unless some you people, have a whistleblower, you're not really going mm -hmm. to know about it. So. But some people bring up like, if I am shipping a product to customers and I yeah. modify GPL software, I only actually have to provide it to the customer. Right. 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 Yeah. You're technically only required to provide it to those people that actually get the code. That yes. Right. Doing. So you're not, you don't have to necessarily publish it on the web for everybody in the world. Um, but if they get something that's that's running your code, running that code, yeah, well, they can. Are, are, are. But and then they have the right to publish that. Yeah, right. You can't prevent them from exactly sharing sure. with anybody in the world. Um, I still like to know a little bit about you guys. I mean, do you have any? What brought you to this panel? That's that's interesting to me. Uh, what about independent technology? Is anyone working on uh, an independent project? Thinking about working on an independent project. Okay, what is it? Oh, um, I actually uh, I don't have one right now. So oh, okay, I have ideas from time to time. All right, okay. cool. Just put you on the spot there. Sorry. Um, so mostly, you're interested in is in maintaining the independent projects which you consume, primarily, or oh, I would say more of that. I own an IT services company. We use a lot of open source products. I highly recommend them to my clients. I fight up against the you have to use Cisco in this circumstance and things like right. that type of thing. Um, when you sell corporate, you sometimes I lose and we have to use Cisco because of, uh, when we do city or government work, it's policy. There's not another vendor you can choose. But so, I, but I hate to see stuff like that because I watch school systems that go, well, they only will give us money if we buy Cisco. If we don't buy Cisco, we, they won't fund it. You know, and that kind of stuff always, anytime there's some of the open source stuff that, you know, I try to know how I can help integrate into them, I think it'd be a better fit for them. And, you know, I, I try to use the line, even when I said the word, I try to use the line, I'm like, well, how does this help children? You know, how does spending $12,000 in a system yeah. license for this 
help and the kids. And it's actually worse than that. Um, I, I'm, I was on the board of directors of Code Club, um, which is founded in the UK, where I live. Um, and that's a, a coding club for children. And we basically set up thousands of after-school coding clubs for our kids at schools um, to teach them to code. Um, and <clears throat> two very good friends of mine, uh, Linda um, and, uh, and Claire. Um, but the reason I left the board eventually was because um, they decided to partner with Google and they started, decided to partner with Microsoft and what and, and, and possibly even Facebook now, I'm not sure. <laughs> and what they're doing, like what Google's doing is basically uh, is basically normalizing surveillance by putting Chromebooks into schools, giving Chromebooks into schools. Um, at one point they actually had to say, look, okay, we're not gonna spy on the kids' email, all right? <laughs> well, we, we're not gonna do it, it's fine. Um, and people were like, okay. Um, and, and this is a really dangerous direction things are going in. You know, they're, they're spending a huge amount on lobbying in the EU, in the EC, and probably in Washington, actually not probably, in Washington here in DC, they're the number one lobbyer um, right now. <clears throat> and there's that real danger of not just closed um, systems, like Cisco systems at the hardware level, et cetera, but spyware being well, I see the same issues normal with them in schools. With the school districts too, because they, they are kind of faced <laughs> with Microsoft or Google in there. You know, Microsoft's offers a lot of low-cost solutions for school. Uh, Google under the Google education program, of course, because everybody needs a free email address. I can say because they'll do that for the schools. So yeah. some super big discounts on the Chromebooks. In a way, though, it is kind of hard for schools to pass up. One of the charter schools we managed to partner with Google um, is it, obviously the best option. It's like we want to get laptops for all the kids. The only option really is to give them Chromebooks uh, to get them started. No one else would fund it. Well, and if they did a grant and couldn't get this, they didn't yeah. have the funds. It was either Google's going to help us get all these Chromebooks and get uh, 700 Chromebooks in the school, or no one will. So do we tell the kids no laptops, or do we take Google's offer? And the analogy I'd love to give with that, and um, uh, one that I used recently uh, on Al Jazeera, when uh, the head of InSafe, uh, which is a network, a European Union network, to protect children's rights online, um, said, we should be putting Facebook in schools. And I was like, um, that's like saying we should have McDonald's teaching nutrition classes. <laughs> After which people told me that actually happens. <laughs> <laughs> and I was like, but I can't even come up with zany enough sarcasm. We have you know? Bank teaching financial yeah. literacy to children. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm sure if the school said, look, you know, we can't feed the children here, we're, we're, a, we're a poor school, McDonald's would probably step in and provide free lunches. And we have to decide, you know, at that point, is there something greater broken with the system? Oh, yes. Um, yes. <laughs> you know, are we trying to fix this problem at the wrong level? Maybe. Like, yeah. So where do we start? I mean, maybe I think we start. You know what? We start at the individual level. Um, I'm, I'm. I mean, as much as I talk about all the stuff that's wrong in in, in my work in, in raising awareness, I am very optimistic that we can change this. If anything, the same technologies that these silos are using have also you know, given each one of us the ability to make a difference. Um, I think it starts with you. It starts with every one of us. We can each in our own way make a difference by contributing to a more distributed topology in whatever it is, whether it's society or technology. Um, so me, you know, Texas Instruments is a, a, a large corporation um, you know, I think as, as individuals, or I mean, a corporation is a collection of individuals, and all individuals, I think, should be accountable for, for, for their behavior, even within a corporate entity, and, and try to push that entity towards a, a direction that they feel is socially responsible. I mean, it's not rocket science. We're people first, and then workers or company owners. I've only ever, you know, worked for myself, I've only ever run a company. Um, so I, I'm not like I'm not a civil servant. I'm not. I, I, I'm an entrepreneur, but I'm a person first. And I think one of the things that we have to realize is, given the amplifying power of technology that we have today, the short-sighted decisions that we make that we might even think are selfish decisions that we're going to benefit from, the ramifications of those magnified by our technology 
will affect us within our own lifetimes. It's not even like, uh, oh, this is for the next generation now, right? So that, I mean, that's why I have a huge problem with the whole libertarian thing that's, that's running the show right now. It's not the whole selfishness, it's the stupidity of not being able to define selfishness properly for the Anthropocene, which requires, in my view, a healthy commons as well as individual freedoms, that those two things are not a dichotomy, that one's a prerequisite for the other. As, as long as we understand, well, it, it, but it's that missing bit of information for understanding what our behaviors do to the commons. Yeah. Right? And, and so, I mean, like getting a visualization of, of what we're doing to the common, commons for, for everybody can sometimes be pretty <laughs> difficult, right? It's really, really convenient to put my junk up on Facebook. Right, right. And like, just <laughs> you didn't really. Mean that. <laughs> <laughs> you will. Um, Take that down. <laughs> so, like one of the <laughs> issues I think is distributed stuff's great, but that requires a certain amount of technical literacy of the users that are going to use that, right? Um, In the current systems, yes, yeah. that's our greatest challenge to make that as convenient as possible. So, with Heartbeat. You, you, um, it'll hopefully be on the App Store as well as being free and open source, so there'll be some revenue coming in from there initially. Um, click a button on the App Store, it's there. It comes up with a beautiful little balloon that changes into the hello, uh, the welcome setup screen, and it just says, pick a name. It's just one field. You type a name, it automatically checks as you're typing that that name exists or not, and that's your little handle on Indie. Um, and on the next page, it says, here, um, select, uh, uh, pick your photo, and the little native photo picker comes up. Automatically centers it on your face, running facial out, um, recognition, so that you don't even have to frame it properly if you don't want to. Which isn't just, uh, oh, that's neat. Imagine if you have uh, accessibility needs where moving the mouse is actually really hard work for you. So it does that, and then you just type a one line bio, and you've created your account, you're up and running. And it's just, it's that, that initial onboarding, and of course everything else. It's just very, it's as simple as it, as it can be, you know, simpler. Um, <clears throat> so that, that's the kind of approach that we need to take in what we do. What won't cut it anymore is saying, look, we're building something that protects your freedoms, and it's open source, and it's distributed, and it's hard to learn, but you know, come on, make the effort. That's arrogant. That's kind of That's Sorry, the that's the client, that's but what about, who's writing the server? Um, there are no servers. So okay, you, only, have a serv that's the, you have a central server for right? one identity server, don't you? It's not an identity one. server, it's, it's um, a directory server. Directory server. server. So that lender information yeah. is going to find out, does anybody have a name like that and looking it up? So there's yeah, there's that directory server. And that directory server is free and open source as well. So other people can but run who's, that. But who, right, but the, the default setting is to go to your server. Yes. Yeah. So what, can you publish rules on what you do with that data? Um, we don't do anything with them. Uh, the only data we have is your username, and uh, when people send a friend request to you, we basically say, there you are, and then all of your uh, various devices connect to one another. And then there's no further communication. No, okay. Nothing goes through it. Is there uh, intercommunication between the directory servers? If people are two different servers, can they still connect? That's what I would love to see happening going forward. Initially, I'm trying to do the simplest thing that could possibly work, because it's mostly just me. Um, and I'm already programming two different languages on two different tiers, so, and I'm not that smart. <laughs> so I'm kind of at my capacity. <clears throat> but once we get that running, yeah, that's what I'd like to see. It kind of reminds me of something like Identica, but what would be you know, the differences? You know, like StatusNet and Identica, which was well, federated kind of like microblogging type of thing. Again, I think the, the main thing with this is, the moment you start, you'll be able to share a photo, a file, your thoughts with your friends directly, immediately. Like, I just had you on, I can start sharing. So it doesn't need to have a huge number of people using it for it to be useful. You're initially having private conversations with your friends, with a small group, and that's cool. And I want to see that grow. <clears throat> Sustain them. We're, and we're in it for the long term. I mean, when, when uh, people ask, you know, what's, what's your definition of success? It's, if I'm doing this in 20 years' time, that's success. So, <clears throat> and we can't sell anything, like I said, because of the organization, yeah. the structure that we adopted. We can't sell because there's nothing to sell. So since most of the communication is going client to <clears throat> client, peer to peer, you don't actually have to have many 
resources. Everything apart from finding your friends initially. Yeah. And that's where we need that, that directory. And that's one of the key design decisions as well. That's what makes it easy initially. Discovery is hard. I mean, the web is great for two things, right? Um, for availability and discovery. And so what we're really building is a bridge between the web and a peer-to-peer -peer network. One of the things I really like about selling um, atoms instead of bits, right? So just like you know, the, the, the silicon rather than the information, um, is that you kind of don't end up in a, a conundrum of how you're how you're.